Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're here today. Ask you to take a minute and fill out the green pew pad to let us know you're in attendance with us this morning. A few announcements to get us started. The first one is game night is this Thursday, June 15th, 630, 830 downstairs in the rec center. Bring a game, bring a snack, bring something to drink, bring some friends. Come on out and have a good time Thursday night. Then on June 22nd, our deacons are having their rack night, random acts of Christian kindness. Going to meet at 6 o'clock in the evening in the parking lot. Please come join us as we spread our random acts of Christian kindness. Our rummage sale is coming soon, July 21st and 22nd. Items can be brought to Fellowship Hall that week on Tuesday and Wednesday, the 18th and 19th of July. No large exercise equipment or furniture. I'll say it again. We don't care about people's physical health. No exercise. If you're available to help any of those days, please contact the church office or Sandy Earl. Summer food program at Grant Street Community Center begins this week. It's not too late to help. Please sign up today in Galbraith Hall if you can be available to help in this program. Last week at Northminster, there was a flip cell phone that was found. If it's yours, please call the Northminster office. Now we have a video about our summer primer. Who's announcing? Oh, before we do that, Deacons, I was going to do it after, but that's all right. Deacons, you are meeting today after church in Fellowship Hall because you're not meeting Tuesday night, correct? Correct. There you go. Here's the video. Hey, everybody. Brett Householder here on behalf of the Christian Education Committee. Today, as you may or may not know, was our final Sunday school of the school year. We'll resume Sunday school again in September. So we've come up with a resource for you to use this summer in place of Sunday school. For those of you who've been around a long time, you'll remember the old summer primers that were given out in the summer. We've created a new thing that we're calling the Summer Challenge Primer. Inside, you'll find all kinds of things to learn from scriptures and prayers and songs and things about who we are as Presbyterians and Christians for you to learn. We'd love for you to learn with your family. Use it at the dinner table. Use it sometime when you're talking. Memorize a few things. And this is families in all types, from moms and dads and kids to grandparents and grandkids. If you're all alone, you can learn on your own as well. We're going to have places for the kids when they learn things to come in and show us what they've learned and they'll get prizes. So all summer I'll be checking in with some videos to see where you're at and suggest some things to do. But today all I'm suggesting is you pick one of these up for your family in Galbraith Hall. Thanks so much. We'll see you later this summer. All right, Tyler Lee, it's time. Come join me down here. Oh, you didn't think I was bringing you forward, did you? Ha, ha, ha. Come on down, Tyler. For those of you who don't know, Tyler graduated from Union Area High School last week. Wasn't it last week? June 2nd. She made it through. Um... And Tyler's going to Youngstown State in the fall, majoring in criminal justice. Think about that for a second. Those of you who know Tyler would be very afraid of Tyler being in criminal justice. I don't want to be in trouble and having Tyler chase me down, especially with a gun. So those of you who may not know Tyler really well, Tyler is in, was involved in all kinds of stuff in high school, from the marching band to musicals. She was in track. What else did you do? That's about it. She was in Girl Scouts. Tyler has done a whole bunch of stuff, and Tyler is a fantastic young lady. She is funny, but at the same time, she's very confident, and she can be a touch bossy. 
If you would ask her brothers, they would agree with you on that, that she's a little bossy sometimes, right? Oh, she just said she gets it from her mom. <laughs> and if you know Lisa, Lisa's definitely bossy. So we're very excited for Tyler and moving on in the next step in her life. And Tyler, we just want you to know that as a church, we are here to support you. We would love to see you, but understand you're going to be at YSU. So here's what I tell everybody when they're up here. You need to find some kind of Christian organization or thing your first week on campus. Because if you don't, you probably won't. Because you get involved in everything else, and then before you know it, I haven't been to church in a year and a half. What happened? Hmm. I'll be on you, because I don't live too far away from YSU, so I just might show up on campus walking around someday trying to find you. Ask Joel Perry. I did it to him. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually did. Yeah, I found out from Terry and Les what Joel's schedule was. And I just showed up in the hall outside of one of his classes one day. Freaked him out a little bit as he was walking out of class with a young lady. So, just know that I know where YSU is. My wife is a YSU grad. I know my way around campus. And your mother will tell me where you are at all times. So be prepared. I will come find you. So here, we got you a couple gifts. This is the gift I give everybody. Um, you're going to read this in the next couple weeks, and we're going to go out to lunch and talk about it. It's a book called How to Stay Christian in College. It's a fantastic book. Um, there's lots of students before you who have gotten that book from me here. And then here, this is my favorite picture of Tyler of all time. Though I saw some really good ones last week at her grad party. But this is my favorite one from here. We made this poster a few years ago. But we're now presenting it back to you. I want you to put it up in your dorm room. You're not going to answer, are you? Lisa, can you make sure that goes up in her dorm room? At least for a day. One day. Notice how you close it up. You don't want anybody to see it. After church today, we have um, cupcakes and a reception. Please come, say hello to Tyler, give her a hug, tell her congratulations. Um, we're really, really excited for you, Tyler. Um, so let's take a moment and let's pray for Tyler. Father God, we thank you so much for Tyler Lee. Thank you for who she is as a young lady. Um, thank you for her sense of humor. I thank you for her candor. I thank you for just Tyler being Tyler. What a pleasure it's been to spend time with her these last several years and watch her grow up into this young woman that she is today. And we just ask that as she goes off to YSU in a couple months, Lord, that, that you will go with her and you will help her to find other Christians on campus to get um, together with, to help grow in her faith. Pray for her as she studies. Pray for classes that everything would go well for her. We pray for her roommate, that they would get along and that they would build a relationship that lasts a long time. Father, we also pray that you would be with Tyler's family as she leaves. Help them to be excited about this and not sad. Father, we pray that you would help us as a church to continue to reach out to Tyler and continue to love her like we promised when she was confirmed here in our church. Keep, um, help us to keep Tyler in all of our prayers. That as we pray every day that we would just say a prayer for Tyler, that you'd be watching over her. Lord, we thank you for Tyler. We thank you for her family. We just ask for your blessing over them today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may sit down, young lady. Mm.
And God continues to bless First Presby. There's a lot of good things going on. Wonderful, wonderful. Stand with me as we enter into the call of worship. The Lord be with you. Gracious God, we seek clarity and the truth of your presence among us today. Slow the spinning of our thoughts, the restlessness of our mind and emotions, that we may receive your word into our hearts and minds. Blessed be your name. is not an outlaw. How often we jaywalk, exceed speed limits, ooze through stop signs, fudge on traffic lights, cross a double stripe when passing. We also defy the laws of God. From such brazen arrogance, we ask the Lord to deliver us. Therefore, in humility and faith, let us confess our sins before God and one another with the unison prayer confession. Let us pray. Earth. 
feeling a spoken mankind or which mission? You know what's weak inside us. We pray that you make us strong. Forgive us and help us to be understanding and forgiving towards others who may hurt us. Help us to learn to love. We humbly come seeking your forgiveness as if we have all our personal sins in the name of Jesus the Christ. Hear the good news. In the midst of our estrangement, we are received. We can receive our past, celebrate the present, and plan for the future. All because, in the name of Jesus the Christ, our sins are forgiven. And all the people say, Amen. Because we have the peace of God. We love him. Let's share the peace with one another. I've got a story to read you this morning. This is from one of my favorite books, Bloom County. And this is the way the story goes. It's a very interesting story. No more waiting, it's called. No more waiting, Will Whale. Will was weary of waiting. I have to wait for dinner. I have to wait until I grow up. I have to wait for my birthday. I have to wait for Christmas. I have to wait for summer. And all I seem to do is wait. Will was weary of waiting. Even his name was Wait. William Warren Wait. I know what I'll do, Will whispered. I'll move to the hurry house. Will walked down the street, knocked on the door of the hurry house. The door opened in a hurry. Well, Will, what do you want? Speak up and hurry. Will quickly told Mrs. Hurry what he wanted. Well, of course you can live here, but come inside quickly and shut the door. Now William no longer had to wait. William did not have to wait to grow up in order to stay up late, for he could stay up as late as he liked. But he was always tired and grouchy the next day. William did not have to wait his turn on the swing. Chuck, Be Buck, and Harry Hurry all sat on the swing with William at the same time. But William fell off and skinned his arm and knee because it was very crowded. William did not have to wait for dinner. The Hurries ate all of the time and always in a hurry. But it wasn't any fun going to bed with a hurt, hurried stomach ache. William did not have to wait for his birthday. The Hurries sang happy birthday to him and everyone else every day. But his birthday no longer seemed special. William did not have to wait for Christmas. The hurry sang Christmas songs around a decorated Christmas tree every day. But Christmas no longer was special, and suddenly William was sad. There was no one to walk with. Stop sharing and hurry, the hurry said. There was no one to talk with. Say what you have to say and hurry, said the hurries. 
There was no one to tuck William into bed and tell him stories and listen to his prayers. Go to sleep so tomorrow I can come in a hurry, said the hurries. The hurries were always in a hurry. So one day, William slowly packed his suitcase and he slowly walked down the street to his own home. He quietly knocked on the door. William, exclaimed his mother, hugging him. William, his father cried. I miss telling you stories. William, his brother shouted. If you'll wait a minute, let's go for a walk. William was glad to wait. And as he waited, he told his family, there are two things you can't hurry. You can't hurry growing up and you can't hurry love. And there's a Proverbs in the Bible that tells us, don't worry about your plans for tomorrow. Wait and see what happens. Let's play. Dear God, thank you for helping us wait. Help us always to understand that there's lots ahead of us and that all we have to do is wait and trust in you and everything will turn out all right. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next time. Pastor Rick, it is hard sometimes to wait. Beautiful lesson for the children. Okay. Prayer of illumination. Pray with me, please. God, as we hear your word, grant us persistence that we may not cease from study until we find its meaning. Take from us the prejudice which would shut our eyes to the truth. Never let us love systems more than we love you. And then give us the humility which we which will accept and obey what you say to us and what you tell us to do through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It wasn't uncommon for people in Palestine to take their unsettled disputes to respected rabbis. But Jesus refused to be mixed up in anyone's dispute about money. But one of, of this request came but out of this request came an opportunity for Jesus to explain what our attitude to material things should be. He had something to say both to those who had an abundance of material things and to those who did not. Let us listen for the word of God from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21 which we can uh, be found on page 1108 of the Pew Bibles, as well as projected on the wall. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, 
I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And then I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is the word of the Lord. We now turn to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, we're looking at Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And as you might know, Proverbs is one of three books of wisdom literature in the Old Testament. The educational purpose is most clear in Proverbs. Its instructions are very parental in tone. And this particular passage is an admonition to trust and honor God. So let's listen for the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 4, starting with verse numbered 1. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in sight of my mother, He taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Hear, my son, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. This is the word of the Lord. O God, may you bless not only the readings from your word and the singing of your word and the playing of your word, now also the interpretation of your word so that it can become your word to us so we may hear what you want us to hear, be what you want us to be, and do what you want us to do. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. I heard an embarrassing graduation story the other day. I know, that Tyler, you've been in embarrassing situations like this, but it was, it was graduation day in this particular school. And everybody's going to get their diploma except Josh. And at the assembly, the entire senior class stands up and shouts, let Josh graduate, let Josh graduate. Well, the principal finally agrees to give Josh one last chance. So he brings Josh up and says, okay, Josh, now listen, I have five apples in my right hand. I have five apples in my left hand. How many apples do I have, Josh? Josh thought long and hard. He said, um, ten apples? And the whole senior class stood up and shouted, give Josh another chance. Give Josh another chance. That's kind of embarrassing. But what's really embarrassing is when your commencement, during your commencement, you happen to yawn and you swallow your tassel. (laughs) Take it from someone who knows. Today we're honoring not only Tyler, but all those who are graduating from various institutions this spring, and also many young people as you get from one class getting ready for the next. So I would like to remind you and them 
about one of the most dangerous words in the English language. And it could become an eternal embarrassment to anyone. Now, this word is not hate. It's not evil. It's not fear. It's not death. No, this word doesn't look or sound dangerous. And that is the dangerous thing about it, for it hides the menace. I believe it's one of the devil's most favorite words, for it paralyzes action and leaves duty undone. The word is tomorrow. Our, verse, our special verse, verse 27, Proverbs 27, verse 1 says, Never boast about tomorrow. You don't know what will happen between now and then. The great word of the Bible is today, not tomorrow. Once upon a time, there was a mother eagle who was in the process of building a nest for her offspring. And so to get ready, she flew to the, the top of a great mountain and found a, a, a cozy, rocky place where she could build her nest. And then she would swoop down into the valley to get thorn branches. And she would bring those strong thorn branches up and, and gather them to make her nest. And, and after this large nest of thorns, strong, she would swoop down to get moss. And she'd bring moss back up to the nest, and, and she kept bringing moss back up and, and counting the nest until it was, it was a big nest, and it was soft, and, and it was comfortable and, and warm. So then she sat on her nest and continued sitting on her nest until one day her baby eaglet was born. She was a proud mother. And she then continually swooped down into the valley, bringing up food, feeding her baby eaglet until it, it grew strong. And soon it lost its down of infancy and, and took on the brilliant feathers of, of an adult eagle. And then she tried to coax it to fly. But this young eaglet said, No, no, Mom, I'm, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. I, I don't want to fly. No, not today. I'm, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. Well, every day she coaxed and becomes soaring with her. But the same excuse is, No, no, I, 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 I'm fine here. I'm, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. Finally, one day, the mother eagle started to do some very strange things. She began to pluck the bits of moss from the nest. And she kept plucking the bits of moss from the nest over and over until finally the moss was almost gone and the thorns started to stick through. And the young eaglet was mystified at what she was doing. He said, stop this. What are you doing to me, mother? What are you, if you really loved me, you wouldn't be doing this. What are you doing with the moss? Well, she kept taking the moss out of the nest without a word until finally the thorns were poking through the little eagle's body. And, and the, the only, his only salvation was to jump from the nest. And when he did, the air filled his wings and he soared into the sky. It took the pain of thorns for that eagle to become the triumph that nature wanted it to be. And that's the way it's been ever since Calvary. When our Savior wore that crown of thorns so that we could fly. From suffering thorns to the triumph of life. Remember the story of the eagle when the moss starts being picked from your comfy nest. And then you won't be embarrassed not to be able to fly. And as we honor those who are graduating, Tyler and the rest of the folks that are graduating from classes this spring, and, and also for the rest of the kids that are here today, for you young folks, most of you, your parents have provided you with the comforts of life. And your nest has been made warm and secure with adequate amounts of moss. And most of you young folks haven't felt the thorns of life yet, although most of you I'm sure would probably say that your parents and your teachers are real thorns in your side. And to a certain degree, you're right. That's the whole idea. Because if they were the proper thorns they needed to be, they were only that so that you could fly from the nest 
and be free to soar. Now, we adults, we admit, yes, we're much like you young folks and graduates. We true try to exchange the thorns of life for more moss. We all do. We don't want to have to experience uncomfortable things in life. So we use excuses and escapes to avoid the thorns of life. Everybody does that. No one wishes you a life of thorns. But the thorns of life will be there. It's not so much your faith as a Christian that's going to remove the thorns. No, in fact, your Christian faith, if you take it seriously, might produce some necessary thorns to help you fly free. Your faith helps you endure the thorns. And the danger lies not in the thorns, but in the moss. Because the younger you are, the illusion is that you're going to be able to live forever. And that you can put off preparing until tomorrow. And that's a dangerous attitude to assume that the moss will always be there. You need to prepare for tomorrow. You need to prepare now. The story of Absalom, I think, is a good case in point. We find Absalom's story in 2 Samuel, verses chapters 13 through 19. You might want to read chapters 13 through 19 to get Absalom's complete story. And those of you that do remember the story, you might remember that Absalom was King David's son. Now, Absalom had a number of strikes against him from the very beginning. First of all, he was too handsome for his own good. And the girls wouldn't leave him alone. The second thing is he had a magnificent head of hair. He only cut it, cut it once a year. And when he cut it, the cuttings tipped the scales at three and a half pounds. Three and a half pounds of hair this guy had. Now on top of that, his dad was either spoiling him rotten or reading him the riot act. It was either one or the other. So Absalom's character was not too stable. And as a result, he ended up killing his brother Amnon for fooling around with their sister Tamar. That was a bit extreme even for the Old Testament. Now this kind of upset dad, how you would imagine. If there was kind of upset there. And Absalom decided, whoop, I better do something. So Absalom went to one of his dad's respected generals, Joab. And he went to Joab to try to patch things up with Pop. Joab wouldn't go along with him at all. Well, so Absalom went out and set fire to Joab's hayfield. So there, nice kid. Now on top of all of this, <laughs> there were some people who thought all of this daring do was irresistible. <laughs> and Absalom grew up to be a leader with a loyal following. And then he started believing his own hype. He started believing what his groupies told him. And so then he started to plan a revolt against his dad. Well, on the eve of the battle, King David was a wreck. If he was afraid he might lose his throne, he was more afraid he might lose his son. I mean, the boy was a thorn in his side, yes, but he was also the apple of his eye. And he told his officers, until they were sick of hearing it, if you catch my son Absalom, I want no harm to come to him or you'll answer to me the king. Well, Joab kept his fingers crossed because he remembered what Absalom did to his hayfield. So during the battle, Absalom was riding on his mule and the mule went under a thick, some thick branches of a great oak tree that hung low and, 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 and Absalom's hair and his head got caught in the oak tree. So, and, and the mule kept going right out from under him and he got caught hanging there trying to extract him from that oak tree. And as soon as Joab saw him hanging there, he ran him through without a blink of an eye. And when King David found out what happened to his son, he cried, oh, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. 
And he meant it. If he could have given his life, he would have. But even a king can't do that. As we are later to find out, it takes a God. You see, the main point of that story is that the young rebel Absalom sought the fatal counsel of tomorrow. Instead of confronting David with his rebel army of 12,000, he romped with the harem girls and listened to Hushai. Hushai was one of David's spies who played on Absalom's vanity. Encourage him, no, just wait, wait, until you get an enormous conquering army before you go against your dad. So Absalom waited and waited. In the meantime, David had time to rally his troops. And Absalom, Absalom's fate was met. There's a pile of stones on Absalom's grave right outside of Ephraim. And if you visit that pile of stones, you will see engraved on one of the stones Absalom's epitaph. It's one word, tomorrow. Like the rich young fool in Luke chapter 12 that we read, is, who was so rich that he was going to tear down his barns and build new ones in which to put his wealth, he believed, as we read, it was eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And then God said, you fool, you fool. This night, your soul, your life will be required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? We need to do everything we can to get ready for tomorrow. But don't count on tomorrow. Don't say tomorrow to eternal life. Develop a strong faith in Jesus Christ, and then you won't have to worry about tomorrow. As Matthew chapter 6, verse 34 says, Seek first the kingdom of God, and if you do, if you really do, then all of your tomorrows will take care of themselves. Oh, when I was in high school back in Pittsburgh, there was a dumpy little hamburger joint just down the street from the high school. It was pre-McDonald's, if you can actually imagine a time when there were no McDonald's. This is pre-McDonald's. And it, you could get at this little place the greasiest, flattest, cheapest hamburgers in the world. Kids swarmed all over this place. It was a lot like Happy Days on TV. I've mentioned that before. That's, that was my era. And in fact, one of my buddies looked just like the Fonz. Murray Pulaski owned the place. I think he was about 54, but he looked 94. He had that worn out, disheveled look of a misbegotten wino. And his wife looked something like a worn out lady wrestler who had a voice that could call the hogs from the next county. Everybody loved Murray's confectionery. You could cram about 75 kids into that place. And you can imagine what it's like with that many kids in one room. The jukebox is blaring. If you don't know what a jukebox is, you ask somebody. The, the smell of grease mixed with burning of art gummy racers. Don't ask about art gummy racers. If you don't know, you don't need to ask. Murray just did a lot of mumbling to himself. And his wife was always screaming at us to keep it down. But I liked Murray. I really did like Murray. He always had a smile when he served you and, and a wink that made you feel appreciated. He really did. He was a deep soul. But I felt strange about one thing. Right above the milkshake machines on the wall was a sign about the size of a bumper sticker that said, Jesus is coming soon. And I sure would have felt terrible if Jesus walked through that door one of those afternoons and caught me giving my friend Murray a bad time. I mean, in those days, to me, the second coming was, had to do with some future event about, with clouds and trumpets and angels and things. 
Little did I realize that the second coming happened every day after school. And Jesus was there all along, disguised as a pitiful old man serving the world's greasiest hamburgers. The kingdom of God is the ultimate tomorrow. It's the goal of history and the reward of the faithful. Its coming is up to God, of course, but between today and that tomorrow are all the nearer tomorrows. And we who follow Jesus Christ have our duty to make sure the doors of justice and mercy and love are open to all those tomorrows. And that the path to spiritual fulfillment is well marked. And we shouldn't wait for tomorrow to get started. We need to do it now. In the Ozark Mountains, there's a statue of a famous statesman. And on the plaque, it says, he worked as if he would live forever. And he lived as if he would die tomorrow. Proverbs 27 says, never boast about tomorrow. You don't know what will happen between now and then. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then tomorrow is the most dangerous word. And that is going to be more than just embarrassing. Gracious God, may the words on my lips and the meditations in our hearts always be acceptable to you. You are our rock and our redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us stand to sing.
we dedicate our lives to God by reaffirming our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And let us pray. We give ourselves to you, O God, trusting in your love and praying for your guidance and strength. We give to you all our heart and our soul and our might, so that we may know the joy of living, and others may see your love reflected in us. Use us. Use our gifts according to your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. We come to the sacrament and also the great prayer of thanksgiving, which is part of the pastoral prayer. And will you join me in the prayer of thanksgiving as printed in your bulletin and on the wall? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our Lord and our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord for you are our creator, our life, who brought light out of darkness and set the sun to brighten the day and the moon and stars to illumine the night. Your glory blinds the eyes of our sin. All your radiance warms our needy hearts. You lead us by the light of your truth into ways of righteousness and peace. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with the heavenly choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place. 
who forever sing to the glory of your name. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. On a lonely mountain, his body was transfigured by your divine splendor. In his face, we have glimpsed your glory. In his life, we see your love. For your image is untarnished in him, and the burden of human sorrow and suffering could not diminish his reflection of your holiness. Remembering your gracious acts in Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine, and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast. United in ministry in every place, as this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ to the world. We now lift up to you those who need your healing power this morning, those who are on the prayer chain in the bulletin and, and those who are deep in our hearts. Give them a guiding hand, comforting closeness, sure wisdom, unfailing love. Here are prayers of joy and concerns. For we humbly invoke your blessing as we come to you, Father, lifting up to you our thoughts and concerns and heartaches and joys, and we melt all of these prayers, verbal and silent, into the one great prayer your Son taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Hear the words of institution of our, the Lord's Supper, when on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he also took the cup and blessed it and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the remission of sins, all of you drink of it. For as often as you drink the cup and eat the bread, you proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again. We've taken these elements and set them aside for this holy use in this, the celebration of the supper. This is the Lord's table. It's not a Presbyterian's table. We invite all those who truly trust in the Lord and Savior as their Savior, please come and, and share in the feast which he has prepared. Come and enjoy the feast.
salvation. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life. You have renewed us for your service. Help us who have shared Christ's body and received his cup to be his faithful disciples so that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom and our love be your love, reaching out into the life of the world. We pray in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. session all has promised to deliver a short message to you after their session meeting each month. This is the Sunday. They met on Tuesday night. They have a very important announcements to make to you. So immediately following the postlude, if you would remain seated, Ryan will do a brief presentation and then we'll be off into the world on this Sunday afternoon because our worship is over. 
and our service begins. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God give you grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. And grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. And may God lift up his countenance upon you and give to you and those you love and those whom nobody loves his peace. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. We pray in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.